David, I would like you to start talking about this possibility of the death penalty because this is probably the most serious thing. Could it possibly be now the linchpin, the thing that Britain can't actually agree to? Well, it's, it's unlawful for the UK to extradite anybody to a third country where they may face the death penalty. Um, and this is meant to be a black and white law. But of course, you know, I think many of us have seen with some deep consternation the way things we thought would be black and white in the law don't seem to apply in Julian's case. Um, you know, I think there are other critical arguments that have been argued in the appeal case as well. And one of the most obvious ones is the courts should just not accept what a government says to them about what will happen to somebody when they're extradited. The courts have an obligation to independently investigate. And of course, you know, the, the trial judge, when they reviewed the evidence, um, you know, on the first occasion, said there was a very real likelihood that Julian would die if he was extradited. Not from capital punishment in that case, it wasn't a legal case, but the medical evidence was compelling. And we've seen that, I think, pretty um, starkly presented in Kim's film. Um, that went on appeal, you know, the United States government appealed it, and they said it's not for the courts to inquire into what the UK government says, it's not for the courts to review um, this, they just have to accept what the United States and the UK government say, and they're not allowed to inquire behind it. And the, the first appeal court said, yep, that's right, we're not going to look into it. And, and rather remarkably, that was at the same time that other cases were running through the UK court system about the UK's efforts to extradite refugees to Rwanda without any legal review. And, and one of the arguments that's been run in the current appeal is the courts there said, well, you can't just take governments at their word. That's not what courts are for. They need to actually test the evidence. And, and, and I suppose this is a real test for if the courts are going to uphold that in Julian's case. Are they going to say courts will just accept whatever a government says and not test it? Or is it the court's job to actually test the evidence? I, I hope that the rule of law has some substance. Yeah, me too. Um, but with this landmark decision from the Supreme Court, where they have said it must be evidence-based, a decision like that, maybe there's hope, but... Well, well, of course there's hope. That's why the appeal's been run. But I mean, I think many of us fear that if this, this case is lost, literally within hours, Julian could be on a you know, CIA plane being... Um, taken to the United States. And one of the things we asked um, the Home Secretary cleverly in um, the UK on behalf of the now growing group of parliamentary friends of Assange was to give Julian the time, if the case is lost, to make a final appeal to the European Court of Justice. We have not had a response from the UK Home Secretary, which I find troubling. Still no response. That's, that's disgraceful. Could we just pass the microphone to David McBride? David, all of this has happened with your case at the last moment. I only found out when I was on the way back from London. And, uh, you know, this is... Can you tell us what's happening? Oh, I, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody here. It, it, the, the government put in a last minute. <laughs> There's a lot of similarities to the Sarge case. They put in a last minute of statement of harm because it became clear that they said oh the, the, the information is they caught themselves out because in the trial they said um, uh, the information is or some of the information is so secret even the judge can't read it and then I mean it's just you, you wouldn't believe it's not a comedy and and they even said oh the judge well if you read it um, you might get kidnapped by a foreign uh, services and they might torture your judge and, uh, and then you're going to speak. And he went, you're right, oh, well, I won't read it then. Um, so it's a bit of a comedy. But then they... So a lot of the stuff was never read. But then they came to the sentencing and we caught them out and we said, well, if nobody has ever read this stuff, including the judge and a couple except for three journalists... How can you say it's actually damaged Australia? And they were like, oh, duh. And they went away and came back with this statement from some unnamed army officer saying, oh, no, very, very damaging. The potential to damage, very potential. It had a lot of potential. To and they put it in the last minute. Some cynics say it's because I've had a, 
um, I don't think I've had enough good press, but I've had some not bad press uh, the last week before my potential sentence. And they, as a gamesmanship thing, they thought, oh my God, we don't want him sentenced the week after he's been in the, you know, the Good Weekend magazine on the cover. <laughs> um, and so we'll put in a, a, a statement. We know the judge will then say, oh, you're going to have to have six weeks, to, eight weeks to reply. And therefore, um, we will. He won't be. You will get him off the headlines for in eight weeks' time. So we're going to have to get another headline in eight weeks' time. But uh, yeah, it's it's now the battle of the PR. We're probably the fact that they are so scared. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to get better PR, but the fact that the, the way that they are behaving are. Uh, it seems to be suggesting a bit like a scientist case that they're pretty scared of the fact that the, a, a lot of the public are behind me and if they imprison me there's going to be a bit of a, an uproar like there was when all those ads were playing at the beginning of this. <laughs> <laughs> you rowdy, rowdy audience. How long are you going to have a riot before the film started? <laughs> so did I. David, it is so close because I don't know if you all remember but after the Afghan war diaries came out, there was this phrase that kept being uttered over and over again that WikiLeaks had blood on their hands. And there was a very astute comment about that, that this was about hypothetical blood as opposed to the real blood that had been shed in the war and by the Americans. Um, so we're talking hypothetical Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. But they'll probably still get away with it. Oh, hypothetical uh, cabinet in, uh, you know, cabinet in confidence about things that happened 10 years ago in, you know, yeah. countries. You know, it, we do kid ourselves that this is really, you know, some sort of super dangerous thing. Where, on the other hand, as you rightly pointed out, an unjust war uh, lies on a grand scale. War criminals is a little bit worse than the hypothetical uh, cabinet oh, yeah, in conflict. Sure.